All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Jim Wolfenberger. I work for uh, Motorola Solutions and here today uh, as part of our panel to have a discussion in and around the area of connecting to spirit law enforcement technologies. Really the route and the platform for what we'll be speaking about today are primarily real-time crime centers, real-time operation centers, and we'll work through some of the nuances of both standing them up, operating them, and sustaining them into the future. Um, I uh, retired colonel from the Colorado State Patrol. I spent a, a career in policing and I've been with Motorola for the last five years. Um, joined today by a very distinguished panel uh, from New Orleans, Louisiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, Niagara Regional Policing Services in Ontario, Canada, and the Springfield, Massachusetts Police Department. Um, so what I'd like to do is turn it over to the panel to introduce themselves and uh, um, maybe just a, a, a brief statement around their agency and size of the agency, please. Uh, my name is George Brown. I'm a retired New Orleans police officer. I'm the IT manager for the Real Time Crime Center in New Orleans. Um, I have 12 years as a New Orleans police officer, eight of which primarily in IT. Uh, the New Orleans Police Department supports about roughly 1,200 police officers. My name is Ross Bourgeois, and I'm the administrator for the Real Time Crime Center in New Orleans. Um, the New Orleans Police Department, like, like Barlow said, is about 1,200 uh, officers strong. Uh, our, our crime center falls under the Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness for the city. We're a little different in that way. Our, our focus is on supporting public safety in general, police, <coughs> fire, EMS, and emergency management. I'm Brian Roach, uh, Chief of Police for the Indianapolis, Indiana Police Department. Um, we have about, uh, we're budgeted for 1,712 police officers. Uh, we have about 1,625 right now. Uh, we have a, uh, a real-time crime center that was kind of set up during the Super Bowl in 2011 or 2012, uh, but it really hasn't been maintained since then, and there's nothing real about it right now, and so that's why we're, we're <laughs> engaged here. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Brian McCullough, Chief of Police with uh, Niagara Regional Police Service in Canada. Um, we're about uh, 1,000 members total. Uh, we're responsible for policing uh, the area that's uh, sort of sandwiched between Lake Ontario to the north, Lake Erie to the south, and the Niagara River with that little thing in the middle called uh, Niagara Falls that uh, presents a bit of a, uh, a problem for boats navigating the waterways there. Um, we, uh, we've had a, um, a real-time operation center that's been part of a pilot project for the last uh, year, and uh, we are looking to, uh, to move that forward, uh, as, and again, for a, a small to medium-sized police service and what that looks like in a model that uh, works best for us. Good afternoon. John Barbary, uh, Police Commissioner, Springfield, Massachusetts. We have about 510 sworn for a city of about 33 square miles and about 156,000. We looked at uh, a real-time center beginning in 2014, started the work on it in 2015, and just stood it up in 2018. Um, we've got some phenomenal people and uh, a great staff, and we've had uh, a lot of success and a great partner in Motorola. I'm Christina Fernandez. I'm the supervisor in the Crime Analysis Unit, and I also supervise the Real-Time Crime Center. And as the commissioner said, we started the process in October of 2015. We went live in April of 2018. Um, this little thing called the MGM Casino opened in our city in August of 2018, so it's been an interesting process integrating all those things. But Motorola has been an incredible partner, and we've had a great deal of success already. Great, thank you. So today we're really gonna focus on just some various aspects. We're gonna walk through and have some, some Q&A uh, amongst the panel and some discussion kind of delving into each of the respective centers, the capabilities and some of the challenges uh, that they've had to be either overcome or that are anticipated in terms of uh, working through them. We'll certainly save time towards the end uh, for some any questions that, that come from the audience that people would like to be able to ask any of our distinguished guests uh, and maybe glean some of their experiences or frankly share some of yours as well. Um, first question I'd like to point to uh, Chief Roach is uh, kind of some of the initial comp uh, uh, composition of your vision within the, the city, kind of where you started and, and, and what you envision needing in order to be able to uh, accomplish this capability of a real-time crime center. So Indianapolis, I think, is, uh, uh, at least in my mind, is a little different than other cities because we've actually kind of gone backwards uh, technology-wise. Uh, if you look at us several years ago, 
we had in-house uh, uh, technicians and, and IT professionals who spent a lot of time finding out what our officers wanted and needed and put in-house products together. The problem with that was we were never able to maintain that. And when platforms changed, uh, you, you had to spend time uh, re-engineering things. And uh, so the, the ability to uh, glean information uh, uh, quickly kind of went away for us. Um, as we, we, we also have a city administration that looks over our IT. And uh, so we became uh, part of the uh, total enterprise. And so public safety wasn't uh, seen as different from the clerk's office or the court's office and in other areas. So we really struggled uh, being able to perform our mission. Um, here recently, uh, Indianapolis has seen an uptick in its violence over the last three or four years, and so we have been really focused on violence. And as you focus on anything, you need data. And uh, we spent several years uh, looking for that company or that data, somebody that can both integrate all the silos of information that we have uh, and at the same time allow that to, to be available to the officers at their fingertip. And so we moved forward with a company that, that, that promised us not this company, uh, but that promised us uh, a lot of good things, uh, got there, they were never, never able to deliver. It, it actually kind of, uh, it made the officers have to duplicate things that they were doing. Uh, so we went into litigation so we could get some of those dollars back and, and find another solution. But at the same time, uh, within the city, we used to have a system that uh, the, the jail fed into, the prosecutor's office fed into, the court system fed into, you had uh, probation fed into that system. All our police reports were in that system. Uh, and th that went away, uh, and prosecutors had their own system. The, in the intent was to have these different silos, but then have one hub that everybody fed into and was able to pull information. That hub was never created. Uh, so again, we found ourselves were in a worse position than we had been. So. As, as police chief and as, as leaders of the department, uh, you know that in order to uh, be intelligence-led and to police a little differently than we did in the 90s where we cast wide nets into communities, you had to be very targeted and very specific. And so we, we began uh, looking for a solution that allowed us to take all those disparate uh, um, silos of information, including our own divisions, our own divisions as a, as a large agency that didn't talk. Uh, so it's getting everybody on the same page down to the police officers so that they knew what their mission was during the day, the expectation of, uh, uh, of, of the police department. And so the, the administration weren't the only ones that could give you numbers or talk about where the issues were or what we were doing about them. From Springfield standpoint, um, from a budget standpoint, you're coming up on uh, uh, some period of time that the center has been open. What were some of the challenges, Chief, with regard to being able to build support from within the city, and, and what were some of your tactics in terms of confronting some of the budget challenges? So the city had been dis economically disadvantaged for a number of years. Initially, some of the, some of the uh, focal points were definitely finances. So we started to build from a ground roots, ca ground, ground roots campaign with the city council and the mayor to talk about the uh, tremendous advantages of being able to focus in not just on incidents but on patterns and trends and get that information out to our personnel rapidly as opposed to a ComStat meeting that we had potentially had before that where we looked at crime for the week before and tried to plan for a week ahead. So at, at the best you were seven days out, at the worst you were 14. So we built up a, a lot of support. We talked about some of the current trends and patterns, the opioid addiction, uh, don't, you know, the don't snitch campaign and how really police were hampered by a lack of information and even when we arrived on scene, the complexity of trying to determine who was your suspects and who on scene was potentially a witness and try not to alienate the people that you needed on your side. So we started to look at the resources we had available and try to marshal them into one point of data contact where we could start to get that information out. It just became you know, obviously apparent that we needed a real time center and that we needed to start working on funding for it. Uh, we were additionally hampered by uh, just years of mismanagement and uh, lack of funding for IT infrastructure. And we had to bring in a partner that had not just knowledge of real time, but a tremendous ability to look at our IT, tell us what we needed, tell us what was properly funded, and to assist us in making the right decisions. 
So it was a long process. Uh, ultimately, it was a, a million dollar investment, um, not just for the real time center, but then additionally we had to, we had to address the infrastructure for our radios and uh, provide the ability to go split dispatch so that we actually had the time for our uh, analysts to get on the air and provide the information to our officers. Very good. Thank you. Chief McCullough from um, Ontario, um, from a, a Canadian standpoint, do you look at it with, are there particular privacy challenges that, that you need to continue to engage with in the community that may be different than the United States in terms of managing and leading a uh, real-time crime center? Any advice or thoughts with regard to that? So from a, a Canadian perspective, uh, we have the uh, privacy commissioner that uh, we have to adhere to and there's some concerns with regards to our data being stored on, in a cloud solution that is a, a US-based cloud solution. Uh, the Patriot Act is something that uh, is, is problematic for our, our data being stored in the US. So that, that has presented a challenge for us. Uh, and we continue to work with uh, Motorola, who's been a great partner throughout this as well, and in, in, um, in really delving into, and much like all of the organizations that are here, we're fantastic at, at compiling data. And uh, so it's been, a, uh, I guess, our focus in creating a data warehouse where we were able to uh, uh, analyze and delve into that data, but I'm cognizant of the fact that um, uh, our data can't be stored in the U.S. So what, as a, for instance, the crime mapping tool that we developed, one of the challenges that we faced was that um, on the crime uh, mapping tools in the U.S., uh, you have sex registered sex offenders uh, who have their addresses shown on a map. We're prohibited in Canada from doing that. So what we found was that um, there would be uh, registered sex offenders that perhaps were charged because we're situated right on the U.S. border. They may have been charged in New York State, uh, but they were still living in Canada. So on our crime mapping tool, uh, unbeknownst to all of us, um, they showed up on our maps and that was uh, problematic. But again, through through Motorola, we were able to work through those, uh, through those problems. Very good. Thank you. And you know, certainly from uh, different both a policing service uh, um, in, in cities in, in Springfield and in Indianapolis, primarily law enforcement um, forward leaning in, in directly serving uh, those agencies. In New Orleans, and maybe we could talk a little bit around how New Orleans Crime Center differs with regard to being more of an all hazards approach, if uh, perhaps you'd like <coughs> to speak to that. Sure. Certainly. Um, when we got the funding for the Real Time Crime Center in New Orleans, the funding was it was a distinct and, and very deliberate decision by the mayor to place the crime center in the Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, specifically the Public Safety Support Services Division of the Office of Homeland Security. And it was, we wanted to be, be sure that we were not being myopic in any way and that we were using the technology and leveraging the technology. Obviously, our greatest nexus is gonna to be to the law enforcement community and to the police, but We've, we've found that the technology supports, supports fire and fire investigations. We've already had several. It supports EMS. To, it, New Orleans is known for Mardi Gras and other, other very large major special events, but we're able to provide information to EMS so they can get to their patients quicker, the, the avoid street closures or avoid crowded pedestrian, pedestrian areas. Uh, we're able to support the emergency management branch through Obviously, a city that's a, a city that's below sea level, street flooding is a is a major concern. So, anywhere from an afternoon rainstorm in South Louisiana to an a, a, a impending hurricane or other natural disaster, we're able to use our network of cameras to verify ground truths on um, on street flooding or down trees or uh, 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 other natural events. So, we, we're able to really cross the gamut of public safety, in, including the ancillaries, our sewage and water board that is responsible for drainage, um, Department of Public Works that is responsible for catch basins and streets. If you, if you have a, an occasion where you have a street collapse or a large pothole or sinkhole that, de that develops, or in the case of our parks and parkways who are responsible for maintaining city-owned green space, so down trees or, or other hazards. So we truly 
have been able to support a, a much wider variety than a traditional crime center. For us, it was it was important to, like Ross said, to not be myopic. It was um, it was something that we were fortunate. Um, a lot of the technology that we had deployed in our crime center was uh, applications that I had worked on uh, when I was a police officer. But we wanted to take what we knew that police could do with with data and how we could share back with the police and figure out how that could be applied to fire and EMS. And so, as Ross said, you know, it 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 sounds a little strange to to think about a call of a patient and not knowing where they are. Um, but in the middle of a crowded Mardi Gras on Bourbon Street, you know, the initial call comes out, there's, there's a patient in the 300 block. There's a 300 block with 10,000 people in it. Uh, we use our network of cameras to identify where that patient is. And as EMS is responding, we're giving them the better information, saying that they're directly in front of, of, of one particular bar, or they started in front of that particular bar, and they went to another location. So everything that we would normally do for the police by providing updated information on um, perpetrator's direction of flight or what they were wearing. All the things that an officer would have to gain from a victim when going on scene, we do with our cameras. We try to figure out how to do those same capabilities for, for, for somebody other than just the police. Um, we've um, done some work with um, using our, our network of cameras in our system to, to, to prohibit and prevent things like illegal dumping. It's, we have a, a camera that can sit on a pole and, and monitor streets and we use it for a crime camera, but the, you know, the second that illegal dumping is taking place, we're giving that information to sanitation department and they're doing some directed enforcement on these somewhat closed off streets and, and making an effort to get that, get that trash off the ground faster before it becomes sort of a nuisance in the community and you have that groundswell of the community outrage about why the city's not being more proactive about cleaning up. Great. Maybe, Ms. Fernandez, we could start down on your end, and we'll work this way by agency. Can you talk to us about how you're staffing uh, the, uh, the center, kind of uh, days of the week, hours of the day, and uh, types of positions, uniform, civilian, or otherwise? Sure. So before we even <clears throat> launched, we did a really in-depth analysis of when peak times were, where crimes were occurring, and where we felt that we needed the most coverage. And that was incredibly important, because we didn't want to <coughs> spread ourselves too thin right off the bat. Um, so we focused on Tuesday through Saturday, and right now we're running from 8 o'clock in the morning until midnight. Um, our ultimate goal is to go 24-7. We're currently in the process of hiring four additional analysts, which will take us to seven days a week. So it's kind of a, a slower process. Um, and we did a soft launch initially, so we were kind of able to get our feet wet and sort of start getting on the radio, start looking in the cameras, and start doing our work without kind of all the pressure of having it all happen all at once. And I think that was a really smart way to do it. So right now, we have one director, we have two supervisors, and we have five analysts, one of whom also does more traditional crime analysis duties. Because we know we, we support the Real-Time Crime Center, and that's kind of been our focus. But we can't let all the other duties that we have as real-time analysts or as a crime analyst slide. So we do both, and they all kind of impact each other. We're finding that our traditional analyst is starting to do more work on the Real-Time Center. Our real-time analysts are also reading reports, producing maps in their downtime and doing all the traditional crime analysis duties as well. So ultimately, my feeling is that having everybody kind of cross-trained and being able to do each other's work um, works the best way. Um, and all of our training happens internally, you know, from the ground up. We teach everybody what they need to know so that they're able to function within, within that environment, which is a really unique one. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of things happening all at the same time. They've got cameras. They've got people coming in and asking questions and asking for, for maps. We've got the phone ringing. It is, it is a chaotic environment, so it takes, a, it takes a unique person. Maybe, Chief, you could talk to us real briefly just to kind of finish the rest of that off as well as how are you funding them? Are they general fund? Or are you got uh, any extra? Or are they, uh, um, did you have to go in and request that as an uh, additional component? Absolutely. As part, of, as part of the sale pitch to the city council and the mayor, uh, we showed them the product. We did a demo down at City Council. Um, the mayor is a phenomenal supporter of the Springfield Police Department. We're very blessed out there, Sarno Cassie. Uh, City Council took one look at the project, and uh, you know, I'd like to think it wasn't just the crime, um, but also the impetuous of the fact that we were looking to between a 30,000 30, and 50,000 bump in people daily in Springfield with MGM arriving. And uh, they ponied up once they saw the product, and we talked to them about the potential. So uh, it was enthusiastically supported, and uh, 
the CFO has been really good about including it in the general fund. No complaints. Proof of concept has been certainly not even just helpful, but cementing the future funding. Okay, thank you. So from uh, our perspective in Niagara, um, we started in July of, uh, of last year, and we did a, a one-year pilot project uh, where we had a, a, a sergeant uh, who supervised the unit, a, a one uh, constable, and a crime analyst uh, that were all working uh, primarily um, Monday to Friday during days. Um, there we have collective agreements, so we're trying to find a schedule that uh, that worked around our collective agreements, not necessarily around uh, the highest volume of call uh, calls. Um, but again, just trying to have that proof of concept to get them engaged in as many calls for service as they could uh, to assist. And we created a drop box uh, that allowed for. Uh, ironically, we we discovered that. Um, I'm sure most agencies are dealing, along with the opioid crisis, dealing with a mental health crisis as well. And so we found that one of the, the major calls for service that we were responding to, again, not necessarily a crime, but a major driver of, uh, of police resources was uh, suicides and, and being able to uh, access social media uh, to be able to glean photos of, uh, of individuals who are threatening suicide and be, being able to quickly identify those individuals through the Dropbox, getting, fanning that information out quickly and, and saving lives and being able to, uh, to uh, identify or intervene with those people before they were able to commit suicide. So we're, we're through our one-year pilot project and we are um, going for our uh, board approval uh, in November. Uh, we hope to have that funding finalized in, uh, in January of next year for eight net new positions um, which uh, will, will allow us to have a 24-7 concept. Very good. Thanks, Chief. In uh, 2016, we, we started uh, our real-time crime center uh, with a, a captain, a lieutenant, a sergeant. I think we had four officers that were watching the cameras and uh, uh, four crime analysts, um, a civilian analyst. What we found over the years that uh, uh, the last couple of years is because of their inability to pull all that information together in a quick manner, um, uh, the, the troops kind of saw that as ineffective uh, and, and a waste of resources, to, to be quite frank. Um, the, the analysts uh, spend a lot of time generating reports that the officers want, although similar situation, those reports end up being uh, 7, 14, and even a, a, a month old. Um, you have a, a jurisdiction that's 400 square miles and in any given year you're uh, responding to half a million um, calls for service. And so it, it became, uh, because of all the different silos of information, it became very cumbersome for that unit uh, to do anything in, in, in real time. So they started focus on, focusing on non-fatal shootings that, that came out and homicides that came out and began putting packets together for our detectives. So it, it, it became, uh, uh, rather than kind of intelligence driven, it was very specific to violent crime. And uh, so a run would come out and we, we have a product called uh, Digital Sandbox <coughs> where the CAD would go in there and the officer would see the CAD and then they would also, then they would look and see if we have a camera close, but there was no integration of that. Uh, and if there wasn't a camera, then they're going into separate systems in order to, uh, you know, look for a license plate, look for a car, going into our LPR system. And so putting all that together so that by the time the detective went back to his office and began and started his interviews, at least he had a packet of information, but that packet sometimes was just full of information that nobody had really analyzed uh, to the point where it was helpful to the detective. So it, uh, uh, so it really has identified the need for us to uh, be able to have something that is pushed out not geographically that large, right? And so we're moving towards each one of our districts having this analytic uh, capability similar to what LA is doing and what Chicago is doing. And so they're there with the command central products and the aware products and, and, and the cameras. And as things are happening real time on the districts, there's also an officer in there in order that, that, that understand what's going on uh, married up with an analyst. So that's where we're going. 
uh, and we think that will be a, a game, cha game changer for Indianapolis. Sounds like it. Thanks, Chief. So despite the fact that uh, I did a 20-year law enforcement career and uh, I still maintain my, um, my commission in the, as a reserve New Orleans police officer, the entire, um, the entire center in New Orleans is staffed by civilian employees of the Office of Homeland Security. So we have, um, I have an operations manager, an IT manager, uh, George sitting here with me. We have four folks on each shift, um, a supervisor, I'm sorry, three folks on each shift, a supervisor and two technicians uh, that report to an operations manager. We also have an operations supervisor. So on the operations side, we have a total of 13 uh, folks in the room. We're a 24-7 operation. Uh, we went from, uh, from concept to open for business in about nine months, which I wouldn't suggest anyone in here doing. Um, we had some very aggressive, very aggressive deadlines that we, that we were able to meet, uh, largely in part due to all of our partners, Motorola being a main, a main one of them. We were able to get the, uh, the product into the, into the center and integrated um, very quickly. Uh, the software is very easy to use. Um, and it's, it was, it, we, the reason we chose the software was because we knew we were gonna have all, all civilian staff and it was, the, it was the easiest software, in my opinion, for someone who was not coming from a law enforcement background to be able to use very easily. Um, so we're, we're very pleased. Um, we became a 24-7 operation. We opened in November of 2017 and we became a 24-7 operation February 1st of this year. So we're very new. Uh, we've had some very good successes. I'll let George talk about the IT staff. So we, we staff um, myself and there's three more employees and um, my best advice that I would give anybody in terms of staffing is to, other than selfishly that I'm in IT, you, you have to shore up your IT staff specific to a crime center. There's, there's, too many, there's too many connections coming in, there's too much data flowing and there's too many applications and, and other companies that you have to integrate and you have to have somebody that can do that as a dedicated job um, and not, not as, as I would have been years ago as just a police officer assigned to IT and it would just be one more thing that I have to support on top of uh, in-car cameras, um, MDTs in vehicles. It's gotta be somebody who's, who's very specific to it. Um, and to that end, we've, we've staffed specifically to the, the core features that we support. So um, I have one staff member whose sole job is to manage um, the enrollment of cameras and the integrations and federations of VMSs. I have another staff member whose sole purpose is to deal with the cameras that we've deployed, maintenance on those cameras. We, we, we build our own cameras in-house. Um, we, we put up our own cameras. And then lastly, the, the third person I have on staff is dedicated to um, our fleet of Mo Motorola Apex radios and we utilize the GPS features of those radios and that's a separate data flow that comes into aware that if it weren't for him, um, it wouldn't even be taking place. So we, we, three people all do three very specific jobs. You know, there is some level of, of crossover where we can all um, fill in for each other. Obviously, I'm here and not there and, and everything's going fine. So, but you, you definitely need somebody specific to the operations of IT. Very good, thanks. And we're gonna stick with you, George, just really quick. And then I'll invite anybody else who would like to comment on this. Um, from performance documentation and performance metrics, what's some advice or areas in which you're looking at ways of measuring effectiveness and efficiencies within the center? Um, for, for from specifically from the IT side, um, you know we have to we have to make sure that we're keeping our core capabilities up and running. Um, if I don't if I don't have VMSs performing as they should, if I'm not if cameras are in the field aren't operating as they should. You know, those, those back-end solutions that are supposed to run and everybody just doesn't understand when things go offline, why they go offline, that affects operationally what we're also responsible for um, in terms of um, the good work that we, we do accomplish and, and sort of getting out um, from a productive standpoint a number that we can sort of begin to measure and I'll let Ross talk about the, the how we like, measure ourselves. So early on we realized that we had, to, we had to provide some, some form of metrics to prove our worth, to show the return on investment. So that we chose efficiency and effectiveness of the first responders. If we can make them more efficient and more effective, we can be artific an artificial force multiplier for the 
mainly the police department, who is suffering from, not unlike any other major metropolitan city, a recruitment and retention issue. We're not gonna, rec we're not gonna hire our way out of the manpower shortage that we're in now in the short run, so we had to find ways to leverage the technology in order to be an artificial force multiplier. So if we can, if using the technology we can save an officer 30 minutes or an hour, or if, we, if, if obtaining the video from the real-time crime center as opposed to a business where you have to download it, download that video to a thumb drive or a CD and drive across town and place it on the evidence books over at the property room, property and evidence room, if we can save them that hour we can put them back in a neighborhood for an hour. We can put that detective back interviewing victims or witnesses. We can give them more time that they can do their jobs. So just this year alone, a conservative estimate of how much time we've saved police officers in just driving and logging video is about 1,500 man hours from January 1 to date. That's a lot of time that we've given back to folks in the police department, now it's up to the it's up to those officers and it's up to those supervisors to invest that time wisely. But if they invest that time wisely, we've we've given a lot more boots on the ground back back to the police. Anybody else? Sure. Um, we know something that we talk about a lot is how do you measure success, and you kind of have to look at it a, a few different ways. The the first the way that we measured it was an increase in requests for help from the field. The fact that officers are calling us every day, coming in every day particularly when they were somewhat resistant in some ways and somewhat nervous about what exactly we would be able to bring to the table, having them constantly reaching out and asking for our assistance for us was a huge measure. Um, we also looked at some of the things that we were able to contribute in order to save the city some time and save resources. For example, we, you know, in one instance we were able to lay eyes on a, there was an accident report that came in where it was described to us as a pedestrian versus a, versus a car, that there were significant injuries. You know, the ambulance was gonna be roaring down the street. This was in Metro Center, where it's a very busy area. And we were able to lay eyes on the scene and say, actually, it's been cleared. The pedestrian got up and walked away. There's no one there. So it's those little things that sometimes, you know, you can, you can measure success in different ways. And for us, it might be just saving, saving time and effort and resources. Um, in addition to that, just accelerated clearances, being able to provide video footage information to help detectives and officers do their jobs a little more efficiently, and we've had several cases of that as well. So lots of different ways you can slice that pie, I think. Yeah. Very good. Just something a little different from uh, uh, Indianapolis. I think, you know, ultimately we want, we want crime to go down. Um, but uh, we do a nine o'clock call every morning with uh, the operations deputy chief and the commanders of each one of the districts. And those commanders spend a couple hours before that nine o'clock call figuring out what happened the last 24 hours. And this is specifically around violence. And then on that call, they talk, they talk about those incidents. Everybody looks for connections. Uh, th this is done by paper. Uh, and, then, and then they're uh, developing what are your strategies for the next 24 hours uh, ar around that, right? And then they're pushing that out to the lieutenants on each one of the shifts and it's pushing it ultimately down to the officer. But we've been giving information to officers for years, right? But this, th this, this phone call is allowing us now to, uh, when the officers get that information, what is it that's really going on and pushing that information back up? And so success for us is, is the ability to to make that front end work of that nine o'clock meeting uh, push button right so that all that information is available not only to them but it's also to the officer and then making that connection with what the officer is seeing or the real intelligence that the, the human intelligence that he has connecting it with the, the the technology and then actually having something actionable come out of that and uh, that's that's really what we're looking forward to just uh, again, from our perspective, uh, one of the uh, the metrics that, that we used was total engagement. Uh, so it was uh, how many times has our uh, real-time operation center analyst, how many times have they engaged in an incident where they, they provided actionable intelligence uh, to our officers? Now, in some cases, that intelligence might, might become a, a, a parent to the officer as soon as they arrive on the ground. Um, but it, it provides them with, in near real time, at least uh, that intelligence so that they can uh, have a, a better situational awareness as they're approaching. We all know as, as law enforcement officers, there's a thousand questions running through our heads as, as we're uh, responding to a call. 
and what we're trying to get our analysts to think of are those thousand questions and how they can make that, uh, that officer's job that much better so when they have boots on the ground, they have all of that intelligence and information available to them. So engagement was, uh, was one of the metrics we used. Very good. I think next, I, a lot of people want to get a lot of questions around policy, right? You know, what are the types of policies, both from an internal standpoint or other aspects of, of policies affecting other relationships or MOUs? Um, what types of policy implications have you experienced? And what advice or recommendation might you provide to agencies who are contemplating a real-time operations center? And that's really open to anybody on the panel. I'll start and I'll talk about our Canadian uh, laws with regards to privacy, which I think are somewhat different than what you uh, experience in, in, in the U.S. So. Uh, from a CCTV camera perspective, we are forbidden from being able to live monitor the cameras. Uh, so what, what we have to be able to do is when there's a triggering mechanism when, it, when an incident happens, then we can go in and we can monitor the cameras. They've been very effective in terms of uh, being able to assist um, in, in capturing suspects that have been involved in shootings, assist in locating firearms that have been discarded by suspects and used to uh, and prevent them from getting uh, into somebody else's hands and, and further crime. So uh, the policy that, that uh, has been an issue for us, I, I guess, for MOU perspective is ensuring that um, we're not going to be live uh, monitoring the cameras uh, and I, I guess so that there's not that perception that Big Brother's watching. Very good. So one of the biggest shifts for us was that we had numerous media and, and uh, residents that used to monitor our dispatch channels. And, uh, obviously, we're going to real-time analysis and we're going to be uh, divulging information in regards to people's criminal histories over the radio and uh, tendencies to proclivity to commit crime. So one of the first investments we made was uh, encryption. And that involved you know, a lot of outreach to the media and to the public to explain why we're doing that, providing alternative methods for the media to get call volume information and response information. Uh, it was pretty well received. The alternatives were good, uh, but it was certainly an investment and in having a good partner in regards to radio technology was critical. Uh, but if you're gonna go real time, you certainly don't want people to be listening at home and understand that their neighbor who they're responding to a call for has got you know, um, a sexual assault history or has been a victim of numerous domestics. So it was a huge shift for us. And uh, again, it was initially received by the media. Um, very selfishly, they were not interested in public safety. They are trying to get a paper out or trying to get a, a quick hit on uh, live feed. So it was, a lot of, it was a lot of groundwork first, but definitely was worth it. Thank you. Uh, also for officer safety and ambushes, I mean, the other side of that was you know, officers are responding. I mean, how many times have you responded to a break in progress or a stolen car? Or do we see incidents where officers are dispatched to a scene and there's somebody waiting for them to do violence because they know they're en route? One, one of the things that uh, we're seeing as we give more and more information to our officers, they, I mean, they want to be detectives, right? And so there's a, there's a tendency to, uh, with all that information, to further investigation uh, and, and possibly compromise uh, an investigation when a detective is assigned to it, whether it's sh you know showing photos or going on Facebook and or social media, and and uh, they they become their own detectives, and so we've been uh, very intentional about uh, wanting both divisions, investigations, and operations to have an understanding of what's going on, but delineating clear uh, lines of authority and and responsibility. Very good. Good. As it relates to policy, we. Um we worked with our city attorney. New Orleans is under a very wide-ranging uh, consent decree. The city, the police department is. So we, we had to make sure that our policies as related to video, video use, video retention, video sharing, and accessibility to the video pass muster with not only, not only the city attorney, but the consent decree monitor and ultimately the federal judge that's supervising that consent decree. So uh, our policy is very strict, obviously. Um, we don't allow any types of any type of sharing of video other than through the digital evidence platform for the New Orleans Police Department. We don't um, we don't allow remote viewing of our video. 
Um, so I can't, the, the system is capable of being accessed remotely. We restrict that internally. Um, and as it relates to security at the center, um, we're, be we're behind two double locked doors. We've got cameras in the room monitoring those who are monitoring. So we wanted to make sure that we pass muster and pass the smell test with all of our critics. Um, the ACLUs, the Congress of Day Laborers. We invited those folks into the center and we showed them what we do to clear up those misconceptions, those privacy misconceptions. And you know, we spent hours and hours with them, um, showing them how our system works, how it's all incident driven uh, using the software. And uh, I'm pleased to say that after the, we have not seen an initial round, uh, other than the initial round of concern, they haven't come back uh, for additional um, for anything additional, so we believe that we've uh, we've allayed most of those concerns. Very good. So, how about when we we do out talking with different agencies? A topic that tends to come up frequently is this area around what is the role of a real time operation center, real time crime center, in relation to a communication center? So, what are some of the the boundaries that are in place, or your vision around how that relationship exists between the PSAP and the center? Please, Chief. So first and foremost, in 2014, we started to put together our plan. Became very aware that uh, as much as I'd like it not to, technology keeps leaping forward and beyond me. Mm. <laughs> and that very soon, dispatches can be inundated with wave files and, and photos. And we started to look at what exactly is the role of dispatches compared to a, a crime analysis center. And who do we really want analyzing those photos and videos coming in, do we want a dispatcher? We want a trained analyst. So uh, there's been studies done since, and obviously the solution has been either to increase your dispatch staff or increase your analysis staff. And I thought the obvious solution, and my team thought the obvious solution was increase our ability in analysis. So that not only are we providing officers with that information, but we're providing them the, the basic backup data, not just a photo, but this is who this is. And do they have a license to carry a firearm? Do they have a proclivity of violence against police officers? So in Springfield, dispatch is still our communications. They're, they're our emergency operations center for receiving incoming 911 calls and transmitting them to the officers on the scene. But our crime analysis center takes that information and what they try to do is provide actual intelligence for officers that are arriving um, that are responding to those incidents. Great, very good. Anybody else want to comment on that, George? So sort of um, back to our civilian staffing model, um, and no one in the room having any prior law enforcement uh, experience. City of New Orleans has a separate entity that does all dispatching for police, fire, and EMS. And so what we do is we allow the technology to work in our benefit, and when an incident occurs that um, the AWARE platform captures and, and we, we have video um, of relevance to a call that the police are either actively going on or maybe it's gonna be held because it's a lower priority call and it's gonna go on later. Uh, we simply advise um, our communications district over the air that, that we have something relevant for that case, um, that it gets inserted as notes into the call. We don't create calls. Um, nothing originates from our center. We basically sort of put it out there uh, in the world for supervisors to hear as well as dispatchers. So if, if there's any type of incident and, and we're the first to see it, we'll, we'll put it out that that's taking place. Um, we, rely on good supervision and, and good officers in the field to, to hear us on the radio and their acknowledgement of, of what we're putting out triggers the creation of a call. So we'll say that um, there's a large crowd in the 100, 200 block of Bourbon Street and walking down the street protesting. If this isn't known to the police, you hope that the supervisor for that shift says, you know, where's the crowd now? And then we say they're entering the 300 block. And at that point, a, a call taker dispatcher has really started to create that as an incident um, for the police. So it's, it's, it's a huge amount of cooperation, um, but you know, from a technology standpoint, we didn't want to, um, we couldn't, and we were prohibited from writing CAD records and editing CAD records, because they're the custodian of that data. So we used the radio specifically in our case to just sort of put it out there. Great. What I'd like to do, we're 45 minutes into this, and, and we have such a uh, experienced panel uh, with some great background and great agencies in terms of their implementation of this. I'd like to open it up if there are any questions that are on the floor that anyone has of any of our panelists or agencies. 
wanted to save that time. Sure, yes, sir. Uh, well, if you have, you have a Right, so of the 13 people, um, we have one, one of those is an operations supervisor that works Monday through Friday, nine to five, and then we have four supervisors, they work 12 hour shifts, um, four supervisors and eight technicians. So at any given time, we have one supervisor, two technicians. Okay, now I, I guess what we'll do is I'd like to, um, if you could offer, and we'll start with Chief Roach. Uh, any advice that you would offer for an agency that is contemplating a real-time operation center or a real-time crime center in terms of some initial advice that, that, that you may offer some agencies? Uh, so a, a few things. One is you really have to get your community to understand what it is you're trying to do and that you're, right. you're, you're really policing for them and not to them. Uh, they, they, they see this, at least in our community, they see it as uh, big brother watching. Uh, they really do, and so it, it takes a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, providing uh, uh, an opportunity for them to see the products and, and, and how they work, and, and they really have to understand what your intention is. Um, the, the second thing I would say is, is, at least in Indianapolis, you've really got to get, uh, uh, you got to get your officers to understand and believe in it also. Not only does the community have to, but your officers have to understand, again, what your intentions are uh, and what you really want to use the products for. And, and more importantly, what does that mean for them, right? Uh, we're getting ready. At the end of this month, we'll, we will have replaced our 22-year-old CAD. Uh, a little difference between technology 22 years ago and, and to now. What's this? automatic vehicle locator stuff, you know, what, what do you mean you're gonna be able to know where I'm at? Uh, so they really have to understand w how that will be used and how that's a, a, a benefit for, for them. The other thing I would say, I, I, I bad-mouthed our, our city uh, information services agency a little bit initially, but you've gotta have a good relationship with them. Uh, they have been a great partner with us uh, throughout this uh, uh, transition. Uh, they, they have dollars, they have understanding, it's, it's, it's their enterprise that a lot of our things, a lot of our information comes from, so you've got to have that relationship. And uh, the, I think the last thing that I would say, and maybe it's because we were kind of in a, in a, in a different situation, but we're, we're really turning our technology upside down. And so every resource that we have and the city has around technology is now caught up in a new CAD, new RMS, a new mobile client. Uh, new analytics, uh, uh, putting together uh, crime analysts, and what do they look like, and, 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 and who are they, and what kind of you know requirements are are there, and so it, as anything else comes up, technology related, it really get, has to get put on the on the back burner so that you can move forward, and then you'll have to get to that, and that's something that we didn't uh, take into account uh, because it's it's a heavy lift, um, and it, at least it is for us. Good advice, George. So um, to follow uh, what she was saying about bringing in IT, uh, I really believe you have to bring in IT early. And I know, I know this is a Chiefs conference, but um, shame on you if you don't bring IT people in on day one. Uh, those are going to be the people that, that really weigh the deliverables um, and, and manage expectations and outcomes. And if you don't, if you don't manage that early on, um, it's going to really develop a feeling that, that you didn't get exactly what you thought you were going to have delivered as a product. And, those IT staff that are the ones that actually make the connections uh, and make things happen, that's, that's where you can really manage and leverage the power of a product. Uh, to this day, if you manage um, what the del deliverables are, you, you get to roll out a product at the pace by which you need. And I, I, We're a year in, and there are still some features I have yet to deploy. Um, it's about managing expectations of what we're capable of doing versus what it, the expectations are that we should be doing. So uh, I would highly encourage anybody um, interested in building any of these to bring in your bottom bottom barrel IT people, the ones that you would not normally invite to a meeting, and, and make sure their their voice is the most important because they're going to be the ones that uh, really get it off the ground. Say device. Travel is my is probably my biggest advice to give to anyone. Travel, go out there and look at w other centers, your your sister cities your comparable cities, and even, even cities larger or smaller than you. Interact with those people that, that have put these things together, learn from them. Every city that we travel to, 
um, throughout the process of building this, this center and, and even today, I've had a definitive takeaway. Everyone that's come to New Orleans to see our center, whether they're in the formative stages of, 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 of concept or they're about to roll their center out, I've had some sort of definitive takeaway, um, some positive takeaway from that, from that uh, interaction. So interact with your peers, interact with, you know, bring the folks that are gonna interact at that, at that same level to the, to, along those trips and, um, and see and do as much as you can because the technology out there is, is, is gonna be limitless. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I would just echo those comments with regards to an environmental scan and uh, the importance of, uh, of seeing that there are a lot of different models out there. Uh, some, depending on the size of your agency, absolutely don't make sense. And then there's others that absolutely do make sense. So it's a matter of, uh, as, uh, as was alluded to earlier, finding a model that works for you and, and uh, leveraging those takeaways that you, that you glean from those, uh, uh, the scan that you do and the travel that you do. Uh, educate your decision makers. Uh, for, for myself, it's a, it's a board that ultimately is responsible for approving my ask. So um, we, we leveraged that and uh, brought our board members to Chicago, uh, to Motorola, to see the, uh, the technologies that are available and how that can assist public safety, uh, and that uh, has been critical along the way to, to get approval, first of all, for the pilot project. And then um, we think we've got the support going forward uh, to get us to a full-time, uh, real-time operation center. Um, highlight the wins that you, uh, that you get along the way uh, to get the buy-in from both the frontline officers and our communications unit. Um, for us, it's been really important to, to show that um, the Real-Time Operations Center does not uh, take away from the role of our communicators and dispatchers, that uh, it's, it's really an augmentation of what they currently do. If they had 12 hands and could uh, access all the different databases while they're trying to uh, dispatch it at the same time. Uh, and, and again, I, I would recommend the incremental rollout because uh, it's an awfully big animal to try and ta uh, take on all at once and just do that incremental rollout and make sure that uh, you've got one thing solidified then add on something new if you need to. Chief Barber. Some great suggestions and, and some of them I'm, I'm probably gonna repeat with some variations. One is certainly IT. Uh, consider an IT consultant with a specialty in regards to this. If your own IT people are not familiar with the software or the hardware required and then plan on increasing your IT staff to support it because it's useless to have a million dollar center and have something go wrong and nobody there to fix it. So you're definitely gonna need the IT support staff and they're just, um, they're just crucial to the process. The groundwork, get the buy-in, not just from your patrol officers, but your middle managers. Your middle managers will either sync or support anything that you do. The detectives especially. Uh, detectives are very, very jealous of their work, um, as I think my counterpart from Indianapolis has pointed out and they will certainly feel threatened. So put them in a room, buy them some food, threaten to kill them if they don't get on board, uh, but get the buy-in because, because uh, without it, the, the, uh, the information won't be utilized. Get a backup project manager. Here's a, something I learned myself, my project manager retired in the middle. Uh, so you definitely wanna have somebody uh, working in tandem with whoever that you choose uh, so that the project doesn't uh, get any setbacks or any delays and then uh, really often contact with your government officials. Uh, prepare them for the bump, because it's not just the technology. Um, as, it, as occurred with us, it is the preparation and all the work and the money that you have to invest in your infrastructure to accept the technology. Uh, pick a phenomenal partner with not just the knowledge of the software, but the hardware and the radio technology that'll be involved. Uh, because again, you're going to be looking at some radio improvements. Are you going to be handling a lot more radio traffic? Are you going to go split dispatch? Are you going to go to encryption? It's all got to merge together and work. And then if you're fortunate, um, I'm sure that a lot of the departments here are in the same boat I am. I have a building that was built in 1972. Um, there's not a lot of space. We've outgrown it. But if you have the option, what you'd really ideally like is your real-time center to be positioned right next to your dispatch center and your major crimes or your strategic impact units um, in close proximity with the ability to just walk in and talk. Um, you don't want them isolated in a corner. You want that open air 
ability for people to come in and communicate, not just by phone or presence, but to be able to shout over. I mean, Christina. You all took all of my ideas. <laughs> now, um, <clears throat> I, think, I think all of those suggestions were excellent and probably what I would have said as well. Um, I would focus the most on really making sure that your officers understand what your role is, how you can be of help to them, and honestly, how to reach you. I know that sounds like a really simple thing, but when they're out there in the middle of something and something comes up, we often have people who don't know how to reach us, even though we put that word out multiple times. So make sure that they're aware of how, what your hours are, how to reach you, that your door is always open to them if they need help for anything that might come up that's really, really important. Um, and honestly, have a, have a good understanding of your officer's understanding of technology. I think we learned during this process that a lot of them were, were somewhat limited in some areas um, and weren't, weren't using email, didn't know, how to didn't know how to check their email, didn't know what their email address was. So have a good understanding of your officer's comfort level with technology and how, how to bridge any gaps that might come up. Um, and also just be open during this process that as, you're, as you roll out and as you start working with CAD and as you start doing things, that it does start to highlight some weaknesses and some areas of, of improvement. And so be ready for that and be ready to address those as they come up. Very good. So a really exciting time, we believe, in the area around real-time crime centers and operation centers. It's early with regard to adoption. These are not bleeding edge agencies. They are leading edge with the oncoming issues around next generation core services and EZNet, bringing in more and more data into agencies. It's these leading agencies that are building a foundation to deal with that, to absorb it, to leverage it, and to make their communities safer. So on behalf, of, on behalf of Motorola Solutions, please join me in thanking uh, these fine panelists for today.